All right, guys, this is exciting. We are going to move on to Chapter 4, Ancient Greece, one of the most fascinating chapters in the entire book. And what I'd like you to know is look at Greece. I mean, you talk about islands and how things are beautiful. Look at how many islands and look at that picture below. And of course, when you are living on islands, your life is very different. So geography was very important in the development of Greek civilization. Greece occupies a small area, has lots of mountains and many small islands. Greece is about the same size as the state of Louisiana. So so that gives you a little bit of perspective. Um, mountains and sea were especially significant in the development of Greek culture. The mountains isolated the Greek towns and cities from each other, causing different communities to develop independently. Greece had numerous harbors that provided access to the sea. This, along with islands surrounding the mainland, helped Greeks to become seafarers, meaning they loved the water and they loved the food coming from that water, and established colonies throughout the Mediterranean. Okay, the next slide, a little bit lengthy, um, and we will look at it as we go along. All right, so we're on section one, the first Greek civilization, and we're going to look at the Minoans and the Mycenaeans. And so if you look at the top, the Minoans were a civilization that existed during the Bronze Age. They lived on the island of Crete. And you guys can see all this at the map to the right. The Minoans left behind an enormous palace at Gnosis. The palace remains revealed a rich culture and evidence of large-scale sea trade. The Minoans went to Egypt and other areas in the Mediterranean. The Minoans suffered a cataclysmic collapse around 1450 BC. Some historians believe a tidal wave triggered by a volcanic eruption on Thera, another island, was responsible for this particular collapse. Most historians agree that the Minoans collapsed because of an invasion by the Mycenaeans who lived on the mainland of Greece. And so you can see the different cultures again to the right. The Mycenaean culture was made up of a powerful monarchs. Each lived in a fortified palace built on hills and surrounded by giant stone walls. The palace complexes um, were also used as tombs called thallos for the royal families. The Mycenaeans were warriors and took great pride in battle. The artwork they left behind is often betrayed as battles and hunting scenes, and that tells us about their culture and what was important. Uh, there is vast evidence of trade throughout the Mediterranean world. From 1100 BC to around 750 BC, Greece experienced a dark age, and that just means that we kind of go silent and we don't know what's going on in the dark ages. There's less writing, there's less painting, those types of things, and it's called that way because re little records exist from this time period. During the dark age, large numbers of Greeks left the mainland and sailed to the islands around Greece or Ionia in Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey. Two major groups of Greeks settled along the established areas, um, the Aeolian, Aeolian Greeks and the Dorian Greeks. Trade was revived and um, iron began to be used to make weapons and tools. Remember, iron is very strong and so that gives you more durability and the ability to kill things that are bigger. Sometimes during the 8th century BC, the Greeks adopted the Phoenician alphabet, giving themselves uh, a new system of writing. Homer's works appeared at the end of the Dark Ages and taught the Greeks about the important values of their culture, courage, honor, and excellent. And it's called Arte. And remember, uh, Homer was a very important writer. I have a depiction of the Minotaur to the right, which is half bull, half man. And the remember, the King Minos you got to read these stories because obviously one of the best parts of Greek culture is reading. The Greek mythology is obviously very important. Okay, so we have Homer's writings, and he told the story of the Odyssey, which tells a tale of Odyssey's return home from war, uh, the Trojan War, which took him years. It's really Odysseus. Uh, you know, that's the way the story is. It, the person is Odysseus. Both in the Odyssey and the Iliad are epic poems, which are long poems that tell a story of great heroes. And so you can see the um, Cyclops, and you can see the um, sirens on the rocks, which would call the uh, sailors closer to them, and then they would crash and die. You know, great stories, you guys. <laughs> the most famous military adventure of the Mycenaeans was the Trojan War. Homer, a traveling poet, is credited with writing the Iliad, which is the story of the Trojan War, uh, led by Agamemnon, the king of Mycenae. Maybe you've seen the movie Troy. It's um, kind of the same story. So if you haven't, go ahead and watch it.
All right, guys, we are in section two, the Greek city-states, and you guys can see that the polis was the center, the center of Greek life. And as you guys can imagine, polis, as in Minneapolis, um, is a word that's used, and you can see it in politics there as well. A polis was a town, city, or village that served as the center of the state, where people could meet for political, social, and religious activities. So you guys can see a bunch of vocabulary words there, Acropolis, Agora, hoplites and phalanx and so what you're seeing there is um you can see that the acropolis was the main gathering place in any polis and it was usually the top of the hill so look at the right and you guys can see the very famous acropolis in athens um so it could be defended it was on the hill it was really great and it, you know when you're looking down on somebody it's easier to attack so the temples and other public buildings were often built in the Acropolis. And then below it was the Agora, and that's the open area where people could assemble to hear the polis leaders. And when not meeting, the Agora served as a marketplace. And just so you guys understand, agoraphobia is the fear of open places. And some people do have that fear. Maybe you do. City-states were protected by military. The military was based on the hoplites, a heavily armored infantry who carried round shields, a short sword, and spears. Um, the hoplites went into battle in a rectangular formation called a phalanx. And so that's very important. I know that's one of your questions. And so here we are on Sparta. So, you know, I love the movie 300. If you'd like to learn more about Sparta and their fighting styles, go ahead and watch that. A bit of an exaggeration, but obviously very entertaining. In Sparta, men were allowed to marry at 20, but they didn't leave their wives. They didn't actually go live with their wives until they were 30. They lived in military barracks, ate meals with the army, and trained with their fellow soldiers. Women lived at home and had great freedom of movement because their husbands lived in the barracks. So, you know, that gave them free time, I guess. Spartan women were expected to remain fit and bear and raise healthy children. The lives of Spartans were rigidly organized. Now, just so you know, everything in Sparta was around this idea of a military state. So if you think of your primary emphasis on your entire population being fighting, uh, that obviously changes what you do in your daily activities. And so that's what this section is a bit about. Um, they wanted to control their conquered population called helots, and so Sparta became that military state to do that. And uh, they began the conquest of Messenia and the neighboring, that neighboring city-state, Sparta needed more lands for its citizens, so Sparta conquered both Messenia and Laconia and forced their citizens to become serfs or slaves. And I will say this over and over, every culture seems to have been a slave and every culture seems to has, have enslaved another culture. Uh, it's just financially the way that a lot of these cultures were going in order to get things done to enslave people and control them. Okay, so Spartan citizens did not study philosophy, literature, or the arts like they did up in Athens, and they fought. Everything was fighting. So imagine everything fighting in your entire day. This is another section to really, really long slide, and the opposite of Sparta would be Athens. So Athens was one of ancient Greece's largest city-states. In the 5th century BC, Athens had a population of more than 300,000 people. Early Athens was ruled by a king, but by the 7th century, an oligarchy, which is a ruled by wealthy aristocrats. The aristocrats owned the best land and controlled the politics in Athens. Serious economic problems brought about the end of the oligarchy. Some people feel that the United States has become an oligarchy, by the way. Uh, farmers were sold into slavery to pay debts to the wealthy. People asked the government for relief, but got none. Athens was very close to civil war, and fearing civil war, the oligarchs gave full power to Solon, an aristocrat willing to enact some reforms. Solon canceled all land debts and freed the farmers who had been sold into slavery for their debts. He refused to take land from the rich and give it to the poor, and Athens ended up being ruled by... Uh, Pristrastus, excuse me, I'm swallowing, the aristocrat who seized power in 560 BC. He took land uh, from the wealthy and gave it to the poor. And this tyranny ended when uh, Pistastrus, uh son lost power and Clisthenius um, took over and created the foundations for a democracy. He created a council of 500 that uh, supervised foreign affairs, oversaw the treasury, and proposed laws that were voted on by the Athenian assembly. 
the assembly composed of free male citizens had final authority to pass laws after public debate the assembly became the central authority for laws making the assembly the foundations for athenian democracy so if you guys look at the bottom it talks about how women slaves and children and not citizens of course didn't have political power um, and then, of course, they believed that rights coupled with responsibility. So you might be given rights, but, you know, are you responsible enough to have them? I believe that's why a lot of you guys don't have rights because you're not old enough, meaning you're not responsible enough to have them. Um, we will, of course, get to Aristotle. And right here, I just want you to see this comparison between the two main cultures of Greece at the time, Athens and Sparta. So you see the breakdown between being democratic, military, children were nurtured by their mothers, um, forbidden to travel for military reasons, women had more freedom in Sparta, but you look at the education of a child in Sparta and they were learning to fight, physical fitness, everything was around that, whereas in Athens it was more artistic, the girls were taught um, to spin and weave and keep house. Uh, just completely different cultures in a very you know close area. So we are on section three and the Persian Wars and the Persian Wars are of course classic. So I've already told you that I love the movie 300 and there's a picture of it and I know I have a question where there's a video of it because we are Spartans and you can see when the Persian Wars were, they were Greek colonies, uh, Greek colonies in Asia Minor. If you look to the right, it says green on this map, overrun by the Persian army in the sixth century. In 499 BC, the Ionian Greek cities of Asia Minor led an unsuccessful revolt against the Persians. This revolt caused um, Darius, the Persian ruler, to seek revenge. In 490 BC, Darius's army landed on the plain of Marathon, 26 miles from Athens. The Athenian army, outnumbered, defeated by the Persians, according to the legend, the news was brought to Athens by Pheidippides, who raced 26 miles to Athens and dropped dead. The modern marathon is based on this story. So when you do a modern marathon, you run just over that amount, 26.2 miles. After Darius died in 486 BC, Xerxes assumed the throne and vowed revenge on the Greeks. The Athenians prepared for Xerxes' attack by rebuilding their navy. By the time Xerxes invaded, the Athenians had a fleet of around 200 vessels. Xerxes invaded with about 180,000 troops and thousands of warships. The Greeks tried to delay the Persians at Thermopylae, a mountain pass in the main road to control Greece. And the Greeks held off the Persians for two days when they were betrayed, by the, uh, betrayed and the Persians found a path to defeat them. The Athenians abandoned the city. In 479 BC, the Greeks united to form the largest army up to that point and defeated the Persians at the army of Plate, north of Athens, that had been under Persian control. The area is in green on the map to the left. So in 450 BC, the Athenians moved the treasury of the Delian League to Athens. Through the Delian League, the Athenians controlled the Greek Empire. So what begins to happen is that there is a person that really rises to power in this group. So you can look at Pericles as I read along. You can see his picture there. I know it's a picture of a statue, but that's what we got, you know. Pericles was a dominant figure in Athenian politics from those dates. Under Pericles, Athens expanded its empire. Pericles led the Athenians' direct de democracy, a political system in which all el eligible citizens participated in the government. Pericles introduced reforms and allowed more Athenians to participate in their government. The Athenian direct democracy was really a democracy of Athenian male citizens. No women or slaves participated. The Athenian assembly had about 43,000 eligible males, but usually no more than 6,000 voted in the assembly. The assembly met every 10 days on the hillside of the Acropolis. So here's the breakdown. We have Athenian democracy, Athenian government, and Athens under Pericles. So we have Athenian assembly passed all laws, elected public figures, and made decisions on foreign policy and war. Pericles made lower class male citizens eligible for public office, and he paid office holders a stipend. This made it possible for poor citizens to participate in public affairs. To participate, one must be a male citizen over the age of 18. Athenian government, 10 officials known as generals, ran the government on a daily basis. The generals could be re-elected, making it possible for the same person to hold the office for long periods of time, which is how Pericles stayed in charge for so long. 
to rid themselves of too powerful, you know, like not two as in number two, but overly powerful politicians, the Greeks devised a practice of ostracism. If at least 6,000 citizens in the assembly wrote a politician's name down a name on a pottery fragment, that person was banned from the city for 10 years. And that means that they couldn't lead a war against the people that were in power. So Athens under Pericles, the Persian War destroyed much of Athens, and Pericles started rebuilding a program and rebuilt the ten temples and the statues. Athens became the center of Greek culture, and art, architecture, philosophy flourished under Pericles. Athens became known as the School of Greece. Okay, they're not trying to confuse you with two war, war, wars that begin with P, you know, Persian War, now Peloponnesian War. The Peloponnesian War was like a civil war because it was fought between Athens and Sparta. And you guys can see down below the different groups of areas between red and yellow between Athens and Sparta. Sparta did not like the Athenians' expanding influence and a series of disputes and conflicts led to the outbreak of war. Athens believed that they had a winning strategy. They were going to lock themselves up behind the city walls, get supplies from their allies that delivered it by the navy. They built the walls around the city and the port to keep the Spartans out. Why? Because Pericles knew the Spartans would beat them because they had a better military. So the Spartans trained their soldiers from a very young age, as we have studied, so he wanted to avoid open battles. Good plan. The Spartans had a theory as well, and here's their strategy. The Spartans tried to draw the Athenians out of the walls for open battle, where they knew they could beat the Athenians. The Athens had strong allies, however, who helped them with their supplies and the navy. But one thing you can't help is the fact that the plague broke out behind those city walls. It almost becomes like a germ warfare. The plague killed a third of Athenian population, and even Pericles died the following year. The Athenians and their allies kept fighting despite their losses. The end of the Peloponnesian War, which lasted for 27 years. The Athenian naval fleet was destro destroyed on the Hellespont. Um, within a year, Athenians surrendered, and the Spartans were torn to tore down the walls around Athens, disbanded the navy, and destroyed the Athenian Empire. Even though the Spartans won, and remember, you have to know who wins a war, the major Greek states were weakened by 25 years of fighting. 27. So what we have here is a civil war that destroys itself. So what ends up happening where the Greeks were fighting for dominance, uh, they ignored Macedonia, which was becoming a powerful country to their north. This leads to section four, and that is the culture of classical Greece. And remember, they are polytheistic. They had 12 main gods and goddesses that were thought to live on a place called Mount Olympus. There, were, um, there was not a holy book or doctrine to follow. Uh, rituals and ceremonies for the gods were very important. Festivals for certain locations to honor the gods. Greeks wanted to learn the will of the gods and use the oracle or sacred shrine where the gods would, would reveal the truth. And there was always um, a group of people that were half gods. You know, like Her Hercules, his father was Zeus, but his mother was human. So they had a very um, unique system of gods and goddesses. Look to the picture to the right. That, of course, is Zeus, the big studly old guy in the middle. Greek philosophy organized a system of thought. This is really fascinating because you guys could be philosophy majors to this day, and you will spend a huge amount of time on these individuals to the left of that picture, Plato, Aristotle, um, and, and, and many others. Uh, sophists, traveling teachers that rejected speculation. So Socrates loved philosophy, taught the Socratic method, of question and answer format. Um, sentenced to die by poisoning, he actually had to drink something called hemlocked. Plato was one of Socrates' pupils. A higher eternal unchanging forms always existed that make up uh, reality, and only a trained mind can become aware of these forms. Objects were perceived with our senses. And then of course we have Aristotle. At Plato's School of Phil Philosophy in Athens, did not accept Plato's theory of ideal form, but thought that m by examining individual objects, we could perceive their form. He also classified living things. When I say classified living things, I mean that in the scientific sense. So when you study classification, earlier than that was a system that um, Aristotle had come up with. So some of the things that you guys could see here are drama and theater 
and then architecture. You could see the different types of columns that were used. And of course, if you wanted to go into architecture, you would definitely need to know these. If you wanted to go into drama, you would definitely need to study uh, classical Greek drama and understand that. You can see the theater that they came up with and how it is set up. First dramas were tragedies, Sophocles, an Athenian playwright. And you see Oedipus Rex, who wants to kill his father and mother. They call that the Oedipus complex. Euripides was another famous playwright. Plays dealt with universal themes. Comedy developed later uh, to criticize politicians and intellectuals. As you can see, we're on section five, Alexander and the Hellenistic Kingdoms. Remember we talked about the threat to the North that during the Civil War of the Peloponnesian War, um, they were like, whoops, something happened to the North. And that was Macedonia. The threat of Macedonia while Greece was dealing with internal conflicts, Macedonia of the North was gaining military strength under Philip II. He, and look at him to the right, because I just love this reenactment of a face. He overtook Greece, but was assassinated before he could accomplish all that he wanted, leaving his son to do the job. Well, Alexander the Great, he actually wasn't born with the name the Great. You know, he had to earn it over time, um, not with participation, but he actually had to do it. So he had to conquer all these places to be considered great. He was 20 when he became king of Macedonia. Alexander's conquests from 334 BC to 326, remember you count down, he controlled much of the Middle East. Alexandria, Egypt is named for him. So the city of Alexandria, the northern part of Egypt is named after him. The legacy of Alexander is that he was the master of strategy and tactics. He was brave and he sought to uh, imitate Achilles from the Iliad. He helped to spread Greek culture, language, literature, art, politics, etc. throughout the world. You can look out to the left and there's a little bit of history gossip because, you know, his is full of gossip, kind of like George Washington cutting down the cherry tree, which never happened. Um, but it is interesting. So we've moved on to the next slide and you can see Alexander and the Hellenistic kingdoms again. What is a Hellenistic kingdom? To imitate Greeks, four kingdoms emerged after Alexander's death. Macedonia, Syria, big time in the news right now with all the refugees crossing the border into Hungary. Um, Pergamum and Egypt, all eventually conquered by Rome. So according to these maps, you guys can see exactly where those areas are, the areas we're talking about. Nowadays, it would be Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, Syria. Turkey, just all the areas, hotbed of problems currently. Jerusalem, Israel, Jerusalem is in Israel. So notice all those areas because they are a major part of our news each and every night. Hellenistic culture, Alexandria in Egypt became the center of it, um, of the Hellenistic world. The library became the largest in ancient times. Uh, Pergamum was important city in Asia Minor, philosophy, and then architecture, literature, and science. And you can kind of see all of these areas outlined for you. This was kind of like the um, Greek culture at its height that you typically expect to study was um, the Athenian culture. And then this is the side of it, you know, with Pericles. And then this is the side of it where it's maybe waning in its power, still has power. You know, it has all these things where people are being educated. And then eventually, of course, Rome is going to come in and take over. So you could see with philosophy, Stoicism was another school of thought established by Zeno, both concerned with how people find happiness. Stoics felt that happiness is gained uh, with inner peace and harmony with God. And then with architecture, literature, and science. It's always interesting to see science and how they decided that the earth rotates the sun. Um, yeah, just absolutely fascinating. And you guys can see some of the sculptures that came out of this time. Okay, we only have two slides left. They're very, very um, small. Uh, not a lot of anything other than look, you know, just look. Look at the amazingness information in that picture. And then here's your summary of chapter four. So we have the Minoans, the Mycenaeans, the Spartans, the Athenians. We could see the environment, the movement, the regionalism, and the conflict. Okay, so that is our chapter.